Most organic reactions involve ionic intermediates and the movement of two electrons at a time. So we have cations and anions, and electron pairs are moving around as bonds are made and broken. However, there are some reactions whose mechanisms don't follow this pattern, and they have interesting uh, experimental outcomes. For example, they're not very sensitive to solvent polarity, suggesting that we don't have cations and anions running around during the mechanism. In these reactions, it's frequently proposed that we have odd electron intermediates known as free radicals. And a carbon radical is a carbon with three bonds and a single unpaired electron. And the unpaired electron is really the hallmark of radicals. In this unit, we're going to focus on reactions that have radical mechanisms. This is going to open up some synthetic doors. We're going to be able to do some things that we've been unable to do to this point, particularly with respect to regioselectivity. And as we dig into the mechanisms of these reactions to explain these outcomes, we're going to see that a new mechanistic paradigm is going to emerge. The mechanisms of radical reactions quite frequently are not linear, but they're also not exactly catalytic. They follow what's called a chain pattern where new radicals are constantly regenerated from the starting materials through a chain type of mechanism. So we'll dig into this. We'll see the interesting things we can do with radicals, both with alkanes and with unsaturated functionality, like alkenes and alkynes, and look at these new mechanisms. We're going to start by introducing the structures of carbon radicals in general terms, talking a little bit about how we think about radical structure and the general and key idea, really, that radicals are electron deficient species quite frequently, especially when they're at carbon. To draw radical mechanisms, we are going to use curved arrows just like we would in polar or ionic mechanisms, but we show the movement of one electron at a time since any radical mechanism by definition has an odd number of electrons involved. So we need a notation to show the movement of a single electron, and it's, it's this fish hook arrow notation that we use to show this with only half a head instead of a full head indicating one electron moving instead of two. We're going to focus on three categories of radical reactions in this unit, halogenations of alkanes, allylic bromination, and radical hydrobromination. We're going to look at these in great detail and learn how to predict their products and draw plausible mechanisms for them. We'll also touch on radical polymerization, which is a very important practical application of radical chemistry, allowing us to build out very big, very long organic molecules from simple monomer structures via repeated radical reactions. And then we'll learn how to apply radical reactions in multi-step synthesis and really see where they can provide some advantages and complementary outcomes to ionic reactions that we've already seen. For example, radical hydrobromination gives a different regiochemical outcome from ionic hydrobromination, so we can use it to our advantage. First, let's talk about the structure of carbon radicals. And to introduce this topic, it's helpful to think about how carbon radicals can be generated. One way we can think about generating a radical is through the symmetric cleavage of a covalent bond. So numerous times throughout this course, we've seen heterolytic bond cleavage, with a bond breaking such that both electrons go to one of the atoms in the bond, generating from neutral atoms a cation and an anion. This is what we might call an unequal split of the electrons in the bond. If the two electrons go to x and y equally, we have an equal split. Then we get an unpaired electron on x and y and two neutral species with this unpaired electron. We call these species radicals. And this process of splitting a bond evenly, giving one electron to each atom in the bond, is known as homolytic bond cleavage. Now, carbon radicals are ubiquitous in organic chemistry and organic radical reactions because the idea is often to make a bond to carbon, and we do this by establishing a radical at carbon. Trigonal carbon radicals have three single bonds and the unpaired electron. And where that unpaired electron is sitting is very important to think about to get a mental model of what carbon radicals look like. And generally, we think of that radical as sitting essentially in a pure 2p orbital, such that the three single bonds lie in a common plane, the geometry is trigonal planar, and that unpaired electron is in a p orbital above and below that plane. 
In some cases, the evidence suggests that radicals are more like uh, carbon radicals are more like shallow pyramids with very high p character in that orbital housing the unpaired electron, but a little bit of pyramidalization in the radical. However, it rapidly flips back and forth between the two pyramidal forms so that on average the radical looks planar. And in a practical sense, these trigonal carbon radicals, we should really think of them as trigonal planar such that the unpaired electron is in a p orbital. This also gives us insight into the electronics of carbon radicals because this looks a lot not like a carbocation. The carbocation, as we're well aware, is an electron deficient electrophilic species, and carbon radicals are, are very similar in many cases. They act like electron deficient species because they are, after all, violating the octet rule. I only have seven total electrons around the central carbon in this trigonal carbon radical. And so that analogy to carbocations runs very deep, both in the reactivity and in the orbital structure, as we see right here. The analogy between carbocations and radicals also extends to the stability trends of carbon radicals. If we look at the stability trends in, for example, methyl, primary, secondary, and tertiary carbon radicals, we see that increasing substitution, increasing the number of R groups linked to the radical carbon increases the stability of the radical. This is the exact same trend that we observe with carbocations. As we increase the substitution on the cationic carbon, we get an increase in stability. And part of the reason for this, one way we can rationalize it, is that both the carbocation and the trigonal carbon radical are electron deficient species at this carbon that's violating the octet rule with fewer than eight electrons. This trend is supported by the bond dissociation energies of CH bonds at different substitution patterns. So for example, we can look at the CH BDE for methane, for ethane, for propane at the secondary carbon, and for uh, this compound tert-butane at the tertiary carbon. And we see that as we go from a methyl CH to primary to secondary to tertiary here, we go from the strongest bond in methane to the weakest bond in tert-butane. And, and the reason for this has to do with the stability of the carbon radical that's generated when we split each bond homolytically. This is essentially what the BDE is telling us, the energy required to split each of these bonds homolytically. If we think about the radical that's generated, particularly on the extremes, the methyl radical generated by losing a hydrogen atom from methane is the least stable radical in the series based on the stability trend above. And the tert-butyl radical, the most substituted radical in this series, is the most stable radical. And this means that the starting CH bond on the reactant side, if you like, of this homolytic cleavage is the weakest bond. While on the other side of the coin, the strongest bond is associated with the least stable radical on the product side, right? The less stable that radical is on the product side, the stronger we can think of that bond in the reactants. Radicals can also be stabilized by resonance because resonance delocalizes the radical character kind of spreading out the unpaired electron, and this leads to a stabilizing effect. And so radicals that are adjacent to pi bonds or heteroatoms bearing lone pairs are quite frequently stabilized by resonance. And we actually can use these fish hook or one electron curved arrows to show the interconversion of different radical resonance forms. And to point out how this works with the allyl radical, which is this structure on the left, I wanted to highlight the electrons and kind of follow the electrons one by one. So we're going to move one electron at a time when we use these fish hook arrows. What you don't want to do is combine fish hook or half headed arrows with full headed ionic arrows. If we're in the radical world, we're going to use fish hook arrows only. So, for example, here we can notice an allyl radical. I've got this purple unpaired electron adjacent to a two electron pi bond. I can split that pi bond homolytically, right, sending the orange electron hypothetically, right, in this two electron pi bond into a new pi bond over here, and the blue electron onto a new radical or new unpaired electron over here. At the same time, I can take this purple electron and move it over to complete the pi bond between the two left-handed uh, carbons. And so the alternative resonance form here has a pi bond made, quote unquote, from the orange and purple electrons. And this blue sort of leftover electron is the unpaired electron in the alternative resonance form. And what these resonance structures show us is that the radical character in allyl radical is delocalized over the two 
end or terminal carbons. The same thing happens in allyl cation and allyl anion, as we've seen previously. The benzylic radical, which has a radical adjacent to a benzene ring, is even more stable, right, and has even more resonance forms derived from very similar electron flow to what we just saw in the allyl cation. So for example, I could shift radical character over here using electron flow like this, putting a new pi bond between the two carbons here, and I could continue to push electrons around like so to generate a third resonance form, and finally a fourth resonance form, and we see that the radical character is delocalized over the original radical position, as well as this position here and here. So highly delocalized radical character in this benzylic radical, and it's quite stable. And naturally, we're going to see the stabilities of these radicals in bond dissociation energies. So if we compare the BDE for a tertiary CH bond to the BDE of the allylic CH bond, we see that there's quite a big difference here, and the allylic CH bond is easier to break than the tertiary CH bond, and the benzylic CH bond is even easier to break than the allylic CH bond. So the strongest bond in this series is now the tertiary CH, and the weakest is the benzylic CH. And again, we can use the radical structures, and in this particular case, the resonance stability factor to justify this. The least stable radical in this series is the tert-butyl radical. The additional resonance forms in the allyl and benzyl radical means these are more stable, with the benzylic radical being the most stable and associated with the weakest CH bond in the reactant for homolytic cleavage, as we're thinking about the bond dissociation energy here. So the upshot is, look out for the possibility of a radical at a benzylic or allylic position. These highly stabilized radicals form readily under conditions where we have radicals around. In this example problem, we're asked to draw all resonance forms of the radical below and use fish hook arrows to show their interconversion. So the first thing that jumps out at me is that we have an unpaired electron adjacent to a pi bond, adjacent, adjacent to two pi bonds actually connected via a single bond. So this is going to open the door to multiple resonance structures, and we can use electron flow like we saw on the last slide to generate the first alternative resonance form. So we've created a new pi bond kind of on the left-hand side and shifted the radical character to this top carbon. And you can use the highlighting to follow the electrons here. Now, we have now a new allylic radical situation in the second resonance form, and so we can continue to push electrons to generate a third resonance form with radical character at this position right here. And this third resonance form looks like this. At this point, we don't have anywhere else to go since there's a CH2 here and a CH3 here, and so we've generated all the possible resonance forms of this allylic delocalized radical, if you like. And the resonance forms show us that radical character is delocalized over three carbons here, the three carbons where we see the unpaired electron in the three resonance forms, and we can actually draw a resonance hybrid based on these three resonance forms using delta dot to represent sort of partial radical character. This is less intuitive than partial charge, but it's sort of this quantum mechanical idea of electrons are probabilistic and spread out, and so we can think about part of an unpaired electron at each of those carbons that's sharing the radical character in, as evidenced by the resonance form. So for this particular cation, we've got partial double bond character between all of these carbons linked by these kind of bond and a half type of bonds, and we've got partial radical character at these three positions where we see the radical in the three resonance forms. In this example problem, we're asked to find the weakest CH bond in each of these compounds. The general idea to keep in mind here is that the weakest CH bond is associated with the most stable carbon radical, since a relatively stable radical is relatively easy to generate via homolytic cleavage of the CH bond. And here we're looking for things like highly substituted CH bonds, tertiary CH bonds, and the possibility of resonance in the carbon radical that would be generated via homolytic cleavage. So we're going to kind of entertain the idea of an unpaired electron on, for example, a highly substituted center and look for alternative resonance forms. This first example, I think, is really interesting because we can notice actually two allylic positions in this structure, two allylic carbons. There's this one here, which has this blue CH bond, and there's this one here, which has this red CH bond, and they're both adjacent 
to these carbon-carbon double bonds. So they both are going to have the possibility of alternative resonance forms. To explore which of these two carbon radicals is more stable, let's draw the carbon radicals and think about those alternative resonance forms and this substitution pattern idea which is potentially going to come into play. So we're looking for the substitution of the carbons where radical character ends up and potentially the number of different resonance forms we might generate here. So if we lose the H from that red CH bond, we get this radical. If we lose the H from the blue CH bond, we get this radical. And one thing we should notice right away in the spirit of looking for substitution pattern is that this carbon is tertiary while this carbon is secondary. Each of these radicals has two alternative resonance forms where radical character is delocalized onto these other positions. So they both have the same number of resonance forms. The difference here is in the substitution pattern of this carbon with radical character kind of in the middle in between the two double bonds. That carbon is secondary on the left, tertiary on the right, and we know that tertiary radicals are more stable than secondary radicals. This means that the blue radical is more stable overall than the red radical. They're sort of equivalent on resonance, but we've got more substitution in the blue radical. This makes the CH bond in blue the weaker of the two CH bonds, since the radical generated is more stable upon homolytic cleavage of this CH bond in blue. In the second case, we actually only have one allylic CH. There are two allylic carbons, but this one has no hydrogens, right? It's already quaternary with four bonds to, to other carbons. So there's only one allylic CH here. It's tertiary and it's in allylic position. If, and if we draw the radical derived from homolytic cleavage of that bond, we'll notice immediately this is a resonance stabilized radical. That resonance stabilization and the stability of this radical relative to all the other possibilities, you know, a primary radical here, secondary here or here, these are all less stable than this allylic radical, and so this makes the purple CH bond here the least stable CH bond in the molecule.